Yeah, you. How is it you traveled here this evening? How is it you traveled here this evening? By horse. Yes, I am fully confident that you rode a horse here in the year 2015. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Fine. We have what we are, but I understand you refer to as a smart Alec amongst your number tonight. Now, how many of you traveled here by automobile? Raise your hand. Yes, I thought so. <laughs> so you were. You sat in a chair that brought you to your destination. Yes? More or less. So, here we have the chair, and now we are in the chair. <clears throat> now, imagine if this chair demanded a daily salary. It has no other skills to offer you. It brings you no manner of joy. It is a chair. And one day, it decides that simply because you are Austrian, not only does it intend to abandon you, but it seeks to run you over. Would you respect this automobile? No. And such was the Chinese natives that I dealt with every day of my horror-stricken existence. You laugh. But do you even know who I am? No. Then what am I doing wasting my time here? First my coolies abandon me, and then you insult me with your ignorance. Please, you, uh... You will forgive me, I... I simply need a rest. A long, long rest. I am weary of journeying over hill and dale, surrounded by hostile, silly, foolish people who know absolutely nothing of the world. And yet tonight, I am still lonely. <laughs> Please, uh, you will forgive me. Uh, my name is Dr. Joseph Charles Francis Rock. Author, linguist, explorer, and botanist. It feels like so long since I have conversed with another human. It is... Exciting! Come! We must talk! Uh, I know. I will tell you of the events that brought me to be here tonight. Where to begin? Uh, well, my struggles began when I was born in 1884 in Vienna, Austria. Son to the steward of a Polish count. My father. My father taught me absolutely nothing of the world. My mother died when I was six years old. And but it was only at her graveside that I found solace contemplating the woman she might have become. Everyone else was a stranger, yes. Loneliness and sadness forever my lot. When I was old enough, I left Vienna barely taking the time to say my goodbyes, and I never returned. Instead, I sought a new home and a new life to the West. I found most American cities and towns entirely unsuitable, and it wasn't until 1907 that I stumbled by chance upon these islands. I stepped from the gangplank, with a single gold coin in my pocket, alone and afraid. <laughs> and yet for the first time in my life, I felt at home. <laughs> now this had nothing to do with the people, mind you, so don't give yourselves too much credit. 
Instead, I had fallen in love with these strange forests and sun-flecked oceans. I became fascinated with the almost alien flora. <laughs> so fascinated that I began to devote every free moment to its study. Soon, I was named Professor of Botany at the University of Hawaii, and I was immediately placed in charge of creating the first territorial herbarium showcasing these wonderful indigenous plants. Now, I collected 29,000 specimens single-handedly. And after a scant five years in the islands, I published Hawaii's definitive botanical work, The Indigenous Trees of the Hawaiian Islands. Now, true, many pages had been filled with information on this topic before. I know, I know, I know. But my illustrated volume boasted something new. The photograph! <laughs> it is impossible to capture the essence of a, of a shrub, or a tree, or a, or a flower. It's a crude botanical drawing, but a photograph renders lucid every pit and scar, as though to place the herbarium itself whole and unaltered into the text. A snapshot is like death, instantaneous and eternal. And yet unlike death, it is a means of preserving life before it disappears forever from the surface of the earth. Now, as my fame grew, I was approached by many prestigious institutions with contracts to collect plants in exotic foreign lands. National Geographic, the Smithsonian Institute, the American Rhododendron Society. Look it up, it's very prestigious. <laughs> they all courted my favor. And so, it came time for me to leave the university and the islands. For the wilds of Asia. <laughs> now, my most memorable expedition would take me through Western China on the orders of Harvard's Arnold Arboretum. My directive was to scour these virgin countrysides for plant species never before seen in the civilized West. I would be the trailblazer, the first. But there was a price. The natives. Now at first I found them fascinating. They engaged in daily back-breaking labor despite the fact that the villages were filthy with muddy roads, squealing pigs and mule drivers, shouting vulgar language. And yet, these people seem to appreciate the simple pleasures of life more than anyone I had ever encountered. I brought with me my portable Victrola and I would occasionally set it up to cheer my spirits with some Donizetti or some Caruso. And when I did so, the people would gather in huge numbers, sitting standing, old, young, all listening, patiently, intently. It's a constant din, the drone of humanity, silenced to experience simple, oral beauty. I stood apart, removed from it all, to photograph these uh, specimens. It was in these moments that I realized I was still alone, surrounded by bodies, but alone, nonetheless. 
strangely, I, uh, I never felt lonely in the Chinese wilderness. Oh, no, no, no. It was astounding. Wild and romantic. The coloring, beautiful. I love to sit and meditate in the somber spruce and fir <coughs> forests, perhaps just glimpsing a monastery perched on the hillside below. The evenings were still and peaceful. Save for the times when that peace was shattered by the howling of some mangy dog or the chirping of some foul bird. Now, in these situations, I would produce my 45 Colt and shoot the beast. <laughs> uh, let me be clear. For the most part, I, I found this landscape, this wilderness of freedom, quite agreeable. Preferable even to a life led in luxury in the conventional white man's country. <laughs> we traversed this wilderness in a great caravan. After all, one cannot be expected to brave the wilds without a few minor remembrances of home, yes? For instance, it would be unsinkable for me to go anywhere without a complete set of silverware. Or my canvas bathtub, which my servants would fill only with hot water. Cleanliness is, after all, next to godliness. <laughs> yeah? Now, as an old Chinese proverb says, a road is good for ten years and bad for ten thousand. Now, this difficulty made it necessary for me to do much of my travel by sedan chair. An expensive endeavor. As there were no automobiles, and I had not yet devised a means for the chair to carry itself, coolies had to be hired to do it. Unskilled laborers. We must have made quite the spectacle. A white man carried on the backs of the natives. All eyes stared at me in my chair. I must have seemed a god to them. They were fascinated by my presence. However, that fascination quickly turned to hatred when war broke out. At first, it was a simple, foolish rebellion, uh, Tibetan Buddhists bucking the rule of Chinese Muslims. Soon, however, nationalists engaged communists in civil war, and both factions marched down the streets with banners reading, Kill all the foreigners! Soldiers dragged foreign women into the streets and raped them. Innkeepers barred their doors to us, shouting that their rooms were for Chinese, not dogs, and telegraph offices refused to send our messages. The government let it be known that it would decline all responsibility for the actions of the people. In other words, foreigners like myself could be murdered with impunity. I recall one particularly terrifying night when robbers suddenly opened fire on us. One of my caravan guard was killed instantly, and the others bravely engaged the enemy as we retreated down a hillside. Now, it quickly became clear that we were grievously outnumbered. As the night rang with the shouts of hundreds of furious voices, I sat in a small village temple with my coat at the ready, as the officers in charge of my soldiers realized they could not protect me. All we could do was wait. And wait. And wait. <laughs> Four a.m. 
<laughs> the prime hour for brigands to strike came <laughs> and went. They never appeared. <laughs> oh, and thus, I spent one of the most terrible nights of my life. Death was not for me that day. It was, thankfully for our party, occupied in the nearby hamlets and villages. The inhabitants of these villages more closely resembled meat than human beings. Beggars, the clothing made of tiny bits of rag, with hair like a vitches, their fingernails like claws, starved in the streets. Clouds of dust often announce that the whole of the market was behind us, descending like a mad riot as we made for some filthy schoolhouse or temple to camp for the night. Women and children shrieked for fear at the sight of me, and men fought for the small spaces to see inside our lodgings. In every hole in the lattice door, they poked a nose or some eye strained sideways to get a glimpse of me. A mass of disgusting human flesh. <laughs> no longer did I appear a god to them. <laughs> but a filthy animal, a freak. Oh, I can feel your judgment, but what was I to do to help them? I was a botanist, here to scour the region for alpine flora, not a, not a missionary or a soldier. Everywhere, war transformed criteria about who could do what to whom. So how was I to act in relation to the others around me? How was I to maintain dignity as a moral person in this context? How was I to display any semblance of cheer or understanding after witnessing the massacre at Le Brang Monastery? In 1929, the Tibetans and the Chinese fought the Battle of the Ahe. The Tibetans lost. And the Chinese, to intimidate their enemies, decorated their new camp with the severed heads of slain Tibetans. There were 154 in total. I counted them. Men, women, young girls and children strung about the walls of the Muslim garrison like a garland of flowers. And all this in a monastery, a holy place. No, these people had no religion left in them. They were still people, not coolies or Buddhists or Chinese, but human beings. I escaped the country in a bridal chair, with all curtains drawn, trembling at every sound. <laughs> I want to tell you that it was worth it, that it is enough that my contributions are still utilized today but it is not enough. I returned to Hawaii to spend my twilight years studying the plants I never should have left until I died in 1962. I had no children. I never married. I had few close friends, but that was all right. I had never cared much for people, and after what I witnessed in China, I had grown to hate them. I do not hate you. Please, I wish to apologize again for the way I treated you before. In life, I rarely gave people the chances they deserve, and as you say, old habits die hard. I beg of you, 
Be kind to your fellow human. Make connections while you can to your neighbor, regardless of the color of their skin or their country of origin, and to the earth. For it is our relationships and our conduct towards man that make us who we are. Not the number of published works to our name. Thank you for helping to remind me of that. Auf Wiedersehen. And good night. <laughs>